since before recorded time. It had swung through the universe in an elliptical orbit so large that its very existence remained a secret of time and space. But now, in the last few years of the 20th century, the visitor was returning. I'm Colin Marshall, host and producer of the podcast Notebook on Cities and Culture and author of the forthcoming book, A Los Angeles Primer, Mastering the Stateless City. Almost everyone I meet who lived in Los Angeles in the mid-1980s remembers it as a good time for the city. Even those who didn't live in Los Angeles then remember it as a good time for the city. Their memories just come from the movies. Los Angeles enjoyed several moments of strong resonance with the American zeitgeist in general throughout the 20th century, perhaps none more so than this one. The time of inflated hair and free spending on seriousness, the time of neon, pastel, and torn edges, the time of music videos and shopping malls, the time of Los Angeles' second Olympic Games, and the time of Night of the Comet. Though pitched between comedy, horror, and disaster, those reliable Los Angeles genres, especially in the 80s, Night of the Comet now plays 30 years after its release as a parody of movies from its era, almost as if it knew what we would one day find most garish and risible about them. It thus manages the unusual feat of being both the parody and the thing parodied, not just in its thoroughly 1980s sensibility, but in its conception of the disaster movie, a type of picture that had begun inflicting itself upon the city decades before. The disaster in this case comes from the titular comet, which on the titular night passes close to Earth, reducing nearly everybody exposed to piles of red dust. While this phenomenon has presumably affected the entire planet, the film's story plays out just in Southern California and mostly in downtown Los Angeles, placing it into a tradition with other 1980s movies involving downtown and an apocalyptic threat from outer space, such as Alex Cox's Repo Man and John Carpenter's They Live. So how do you evoke an apocalypse on the cheap? If you're shooting in Los Angeles 30 years ago, you had only to go downtown on the weekend, or going the extra mile as director Tom Eberhardt and his team did on Christmas morning. But presumably a depopulated downtown alone wouldn't strike an Angelino of those days as particularly abnormal, so they also added this red filter. At once a cheap horror movie effect, a parody of a cheap horror movie effect, and in its way, a surprisingly effective cheap horror movie effect. And who better to star in a horror movie at this time and in this place than a couple of valley girls? The protagonists, sisters named Reggie and Sam Belmont, separately and inadvertently survive the comet by being in steel-walled rooms when it passes, Reggie in the projection booth of the El Rey Theater, where she works, and Sam in a shed somewhere. God, bad smog. The two must contend not just with the emptiness, but with one another, sisters after all, and with other survivors, some of whom have turned into Omega Man-style killer zombies. <laughs> Oh, what is this trick-or-treat? The surprisingly plentiful documentation on Night of the Comet, much of it collected on the fan site nightofthecomet.info, invariably calls these two valley girls, a term coined to refer to a certain type of young lady hailing from the San Fernando Valley north of Los Angeles. And so I wondered why Reggie drives through downtown to get home from the El Rey, just west of Koreatown. Are they in fact San Gabriel Valley girls, living in the equally suburban region to the east? They are not. When we see their family home, which those tireless fans track down all the way up in Northridge, we see the very picture of San Fernando Valley living, though somewhat less dull after its inhabitants have all turned to comet dust. With their suburb no longer viable, Reggie and Sam flee to Los Angeles' urban core, a bit like the larger scale shift happening in real life today. Meanwhile, out in the desert, an environment in which Los Angeles has always seen a combination of peaceful benevolence and dire threat, a group of scientists sequestered underground exude exactly that same vibe. Having researched the comet, its effects, and their consequences for humanity, they've determined how to prolong the lives of survivors, well, their own lives anyway, by making a serum out of the blood of other survivors. Monitoring a downtown radio station into which Reggie and Sam find their way on their own search for other humans, the scientists declare the girls prime targets. Well, we aren't going to get anything like 300 cc's out of those children. No, but we will out of that teenager. I hope she's just as healthy as she looks. Boy, did you see her hair? What I'd give to have hair like that. Assistance comes their way in two forms, a young truck driver and a scientist with qualms about the mission, played by Warhol superstar and Los Angeles punk scene fixture Mary Waranov, whose paintings you can still spot in certain houses around here. None of the fans' research explains quite why the radio station looks like this, but the way its opulence contrasts with its Skid Row adjacent location does underscore the alternation between excess and desolation of 1980s Los Angeles. 
The same goes for the shootout at Bullock's Wilshire, when Reggie and Sam decide to go on a moneyless shopping spree and run afoul of a group of thugs who have commandeered the place. One of them played by Dick Rude, the skinhead from Repo Man. While not an instant success, Night of the Comet has over the decades grown into the definition of a cult movie. Like Los Angeles itself, and especially the Los Angeles of its day, the finer points of its appeal may elude the uninitiated. But the film has only drawn more appreciative fans, and more obsessive ones, over time. Naturally, periodic and unpromising talk of a sequel has resulted, but part of me would want to see what becomes of Reggie, Sam, and the family they assemble out of other survivors. Impressive as the real-life revival of downtown has been, they'd have to revive all humanity. Great car. Thanks, I have 23 of them. You want to go for a ride? More than you know. Yeah, all right. Well, just be back by midnight, okay? Midnight? The burden of civilization is on us, okay? Oh, yeah. Fitching, isn't it? <laughs> For more on Notebook on Cities and Culture, a Los Angeles primer, or The City and Cinema, visit colinmarshall.org. The City and Cinema comes live to Portland, Oregon's Hollywood Theater on January 25th, 2015. Stay tuned for details.